I'm going to introduce Sandy Jones. Um, Sandy uh, trained as a registered nurse specializing in psychiatry. In 1998, she joined Parkinson Canada and is now an integral part of the information and referral team. In this role, she has provided information on support, education, medical aspects, coping strategies, community services, and other information about Parkinson's disease and its management. Not only to people, with Parkin with people living with Parkinson's disease and their families, but to professionals working with these people as well. This role has given her a comprehensive insight into the problems of people living with Parkinson's as well as their caregivers. And she's going to deliver a lovely talk today about um, the role of nursing in Parkinson's disease. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Are you awake? Good. Okay. That was a lovely introduction. I have no idea who you were talking about, but it was very nice anyway. Okay, so just ignore that. Just pay attention to... Maria, get up here. Okay. So, just so you know, this kind of an event is so inspiring and hopeful and exciting for me because... As a student nurse back in the 1960s, yes, I am old, um, <clears throat> people with Parkinson's were admitted to the hospital relatively soon after they were diagnosed. They were as stiff as the chairs that you're sitting on. We had to carry them. It took five of us to carry patients lying down because they couldn't sit lying down from their beds to a reclining chair. They couldn't sit. It meant patients were automatically diapered because they couldn't sit on the toilet. There is nothing that resembles Parkinson's that looks like that today. Thank goodness, because I personally witnessed the miracle that most even of the lovely doctors like Dr. Connolly all have only read about. I went Sorry, but it's true. I witnessed the miracle of levodopa, where patients who had been bed-bound or wheelchair-bound suddenly got many aspects of their lives back. My aunt was one of those people. She was blessed with being on one of the first clinical trials at Toronto Western Hospital at the latter part of 1960s. She went from the aunt that I had to visit lying down, she couldn't communicate with me. And then after levodopa, very carefully, I was able to help her to sit and eventually stand and we could actually take little walks together and for the first time in all those years, she'd had Parkinson's at that point for about 15 years, I could actually hear her voice. It was a wonderful, hopeful, miraculous experience. So when I see all of you here today, I get so excited because I realize there is hope. All the information that you've heard this afternoon and that we were able to share with doctors and healthcare professionals this morning gives me tremendous hope for the future of Parkinson's. And you're all here. So what I wanted to do this afternoon, aside from giving you my little history lesson, is to just introduce my wonderful new colleague, Maria, she can introduce herself. We are the Information and Referral Associates at Parkinson Canada. So when you call the office in Toronto, we do have a 1-800 number, and have a question. Doesn't matter what the question is, okay? We answer questions, all questions related to Parkinson's. And please, if you have questions today that we can answer even today, that's great, but never be too embarrassed or shy to call us. You don't even have to tell us who you are if you don't want to. But for example, one of the things we haven't talked about today is sexuality, intimacy, but it is such an integral and important aspect of many people's relationships. And if that has gone by the side, it doesn't have to. There are other ways that we can help you to regain that intimacy in your relationship. So, as I said, if you wanted to talk about medical assistance in dying, if that's something that you want to think about, 
Not a pleasant topic, yes, but some people want, they've planned their lives and they've lived wonderful lives and they want to plan how they want to die. That's okay. We'll answer any questions. We'll help you. We're your guides on this tour. So Maria, introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name is Maria. So as Sandy mentioned, I am the new Information and Referral Associate at Parkinson Canada. Um, previous to that, I was working as the Community Development Coordinator um, in the Toronto area. And prior, prior to that, I was a volunteer with Parkinson Canada. Um, but my main connection to Parkinson's is that um, I'm a molecular biologist by training and um, my research was focused on uh, the protein associated with Parkinson's disease. So I was a Parkinson's researcher for a couple of years um, and I was very lucky to volunteer with the organization while doing my graduate studies and I'm really excited to be part of Sandy's team and learning from Sandy and learning from the clients who call. And as Sandy mentioned, yes, it's it's not just about the symptoms, it's anything else if it's questions related to legal services or disability taxes. Um, as Paul mentioned, we are also really fortunate to have community development coordinators um, who are the experts on the local resources. So um, we are here to be your assistants in whatever capacity to help you best manage your symptoms and manage your Parkinson's. So please reach out to us, um, whether you're a person living with Parkinson's or a care partner, um, we're here to help. So just before we go into our panel, because I know we're running late and we're going to have a short panel discussion this afternoon, with Dr. Conley and Orla and um, myself too. Do you have any questions that we didn't answer today? My experience with events like this is that people come in to these events hoping for an answer to their question. And sometimes they walk out that door and they say, well, that was a waste of time. They didn't talk on the topic that I really wanted to hear about. So is there something that we can help you with today that you haven't asked or had the opportunity to ask. Yes. Is there, say that again. Ab oh, absolutely. Do you want to take this one? Uh, sure. Okay. I'll just um, delegate it. <laughs> Um, so there are a couple of options, so as I think you mentioned, there are some things coming up with regards to uh, apomorphine and different iterations of apomorphine. Um, those are currently in various stages of testing and drug approval. Um, as far, there's, there's a number of research options that are being looked at. Um, we still don't understand all the mechanisms behind Parkinson's, as we've established, it can be pretty unique across individuals, and that means when you're trying to find um, a treatment, if you're not able to pinpoint a concrete pathway to target, it's hard to find a specific treatment. So there's a number of options that are being examined. People are looking at stem cells. People are looking at targeting the protein. So uh, there's really a variety of things that um, exercise. There's a lot of research trying to understand concretely um, what are the benefits of exercise. Is it affecting <laughs> the dopamine neurons? Um, so there's really, we're really, really fortunate. And even in Canada, um, Parkinson Canada funds a lot of that research as well. Um, so there is a ton of hope of what's, what's hopefully coming down the pipeline soon. Yeah. The other good thing about research is that back in the day, researchers were very closed. They just kept, it's mine. I'm keeping this information to myself. I want to be the first one out of the block to share my research. Now it is shared on a worldwide basis. I've had the privilege of attending several of the, what we call the World Parkinson's Congresses. And what that is, it's researchers and scientists and clinicians and nurses and everybody uh, and people with Parkinson's and their families who all get together and talk about a variety of things. But I have to be honest and share that there are very early morning sessions and I just sit there and think, oh, I am so glad that that researcher knows what the heck he's talking about because I don't get it. It just goes over Sandy Jones' head. But that's okay because what it does tell me is that there is wonderful research that's being conducted all over the world each and every day. We will get to the bottom of this puzzle. We will. I don't know when, but we'll get there. 
Any other questions that we didn't get answered today? Oh, good. So should we just, oh, apparently there's a question. So then we'll open it to the panel. I've noticed lately over the last couple of months, my husband, when he eats, he begins to choke, or not choke so much, but cough quite okay. often. Okay, yeah. Um, any other time you see him sitting here, he's not phased by it. It's right. only when he begins to eat and the coughing starts. Sure. And I really get concerned that he's going to choke. Yes. Yeah. Is, is that part of the disease? As yes, well? it is. Okay. It is. So basically, um, my best advice for you would be that <clears throat> he needs a swallowing assessment because coughing when one is eating and or drinking is the, usually the initial sign that there's a problem. The reason there is a problem for that, because of that, we've got two pipes at the back of our throat. One's the esophagus that goes down to our tummies, and the other is the airway that goes down into the lungs. There's a little cap that's supposed to fit very tightly over our airway when our brain recognizes that we're going to swallow. Okay? You don't need to know it, it, what it's called, but that cap is actually cartilage, just like the end of your nose and mine. But it's moved by a muscle. So this is part of the muscle system that we can't see, that we don't know what's going on. Things, other things other than our movements, the outward movements, are slowing down too. So that little muscle that's supposed to fold that cap over the airway obviously isn't folding. It's, sort, it's like, have you ever had anything go down the wrong way? Oh yeah, people most can say, oh yeah. Well, that's the same thing, except that that can happen with people with Parkinson's on a fairly regular basis. So that coughing is your best friend. It's giving you a warning that there's a problem. So he could have a swallowing assessment done, okay? And therefore, that would be determined what kinds of, because pe people have problems swallowing different textures of foods too. So the swallowing assessment would give you and the therapist who does the, the swallowing assessment some insight into what kinds of foods or liquids, usually it's thin liquids, water and ginger ale and juices and thin, not thick liquids he probably won't have as much problem with, but thin liquids, yes. So get a swallowing assessment and then you'll know what works and what doesn't. You may have to change the, um, the kinds of foods that he's having, okay? But it's, it's, a, it's a good first step. Thanks for the question. Yeah, speech language pathologists are the ones who can uh, help you with that. Speech language, it sounds interesting. Speech language, what does that have to do with swallowing? Actually has everything to do with swallowing because they address both speech and swallowing issues. Okay.